Um, so, now you heard a lot of talks, and we're going now to, to listen to some researchers talking about a meta perspective, talking about the summary. So, I'm very happy to, uh, to invite Eugenio, the track leader. He conceptualized the, the track uh, with Celine Grousseau Daniel. Yeah. Okay, and this is my this is my alarm clock again. Uh, did I say it right? Celia. Celia Grousson Daniel. Okay, she doesn't want to be named, so we have to say it several times. Um, and we are very happy to um, to shut down my clock. Yeah, we are very happy about that in the first place. Uh, and. Um, to welcome on the subject of the future of citizen science and collaborative learning, uh, free researchers, may I uh, ask Primavera de Filippi to come on stage, as well as uh, Charlotte, Knips, Charlotte Knips and Anna von Teschenhausen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All of the three of you are researchers uh, on, uh, on different perspectives on the relevant topic here, and I would like you to introduce yourself very briefly. So I'm Primavera de Filippi. I'm a legal researcher at uh, Harvard, at the Bergman Center for Internet and Society, and uh, at the CNRS here in Paris. And um, basically, most of my research at the moment is focusing on the legal challenges and uh, the opportunities that are provided by blockchain technologies. Hi, I'm Charlotte Knips. I work at the Fraunhofer Institute Umsicht for Applied Environmental and Energy Sciences. But I am I'm working there as a philosopher on open and alternative innovation systems and sustainable research and development. And so we are asking how we could open up the innovation system by means of fab labs and or innovation festivals and getting citizens to participate. Good afternoon. I am Anna von Teschenhausen. I am an independent researcher on citizen science and knowledge commons. I would love to add to this discussion some of the findings of the research I have been working on for the past year on challenges of citizen science from the perspective of decision makers uh, within UN agencies, NGOs and government. And I will especially focus on the role of accountability and trust uh, as great challenges of uh, for adoption of this kind of approaches, this collaborative approaches for uh, data collection and analysis, information and knowledge production. And I hope to have a great discussion with you. And that's it. So, um, <coughs> we should have uh, one very fancy app to make questions, but it's not working. <laughs> but it's very nice app, Slido, by the way. And uh, so I, meanwhile, we, we can make some questions, me and uh, Josef, uh, but feel free to ask any questions. We will give you the mic. On so probably we have, a, we have uh, the panel doing like a, a, sh a brief conversation, like like 15 minutes or something, and then we go to the audience and come back to the panel again. Sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So um, I am the guy running around with the, mi um, with the mic afterwards. So just for you to have, to have some idea on the time. We are really punctual here. We are punctual people. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to the audience and enjoy the show. Have fun. So I think one of the most urgent issues is um, how, how all these practices can be sort of um, um, enabled by law and, uh, and technology. So not only blockchain, but in general law. So how, these, um, how the institutions can, can sort of embrace this, uh, these models and allow for a safe citizen science to be happen. Um, you're all free to answer. <laughs> it goes like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, looking, I cannot speak about uh, law, 
I, I will leave that for Primavera, but uh, from the perspective of institutions, I think uh, in order to, to bring some of the values which has been, uh, have been discussed here during uh, many of the talks, the, all the previous talks, uh, which uh, are talking about collaboration, uh, about other kinds of knowledge production and recognition, such as citizen science, uh, in order to get these values from this uh, community, like this paradigm to the dominant paradigm, to the, from the edges to the center, uh, not just, some people say we need a crisis for this kind of thing to happen. And, uh, but I think uh, a lot can be done also through this course and through emphasizing uh, especially the role of trust on that. Because here we, we have been talking a lot uh, about let's uh, involve citizen science and uh, science uh, as being the most, uh, the main source of knowledge, the only legitimate and um, reliable one, and this is uh, not really uh, uh, accepted by decision makers, people who are uh, taking the decisions from the top and who have like more broad impacts on the society. These people, they are really uh, afraid of adopting these technologies, they are afraid of, of uh, using uh, the input of citizens and so, so on. And I think a great question is to ask, why are they afraid of that? And many of them, I have, do so, I have done some uh, interviews uh, with people in the UN and in many uh, international NGOs, and they also call, uh, they call data, uh, about data quality, but they say a lot about trustworthy data and they don't really trust the citizens to, to be providing them with the information they need, and they, and they don't feel that they have the right to use this information. Otherwise, who will, uh, if something goes wrong uh, with a decision that was made based upon uh, citizen science data, for instance, who is going to be blamed? The citizens are going to be blamed? I will let it open. Okay. Um. My, on what you said about the legal system or you about um, uh, institutions being afraid to use the citizens' contribution, well, I'm, as I'm talking about applied research, or research and, de and development and innovation, um, it's more the dangerous not that um, the companies are afraid to use the citizens' contribution, but they use it in a one, only in one direction. It's like that so-called inbound open innovation when companies use uh, ideas from people um, without uh, ret retri retributing them uh, properly or recognizing it. Um, and that's also a problem with the, like the legal system or for innovation. It's, it's traditionally, um, it's, built around, it's built around companies or corporations as innovators and producers. So the patent system actually is favoring the traditional company-based innovation. So that's also a problem for alternative and open innovation spaces. Yeah, um, apart from those intern, maybe intern problems also by when you do an open and collaborative innovation, who has contributed what, and then if it might, um, if you might get money out of it later, who will get what back and all, and that's all problems that would need further regulation or framing maybe in the future? Um, okay, so at the legal level, I think there is like two uh, really important things. One, unfortunately, I'm actually not at all an expert on, which is the regulatory problems. Um, I have no idea about this, but I assume that, that there is a lot of problem. Um, the one that I can contribute to is the intellectual property level. And um, I think that we're actually at a really interesting point in time where uh, we're encountering a little bit the same problem that copyright has encountered at, at the time of the digital technologies, which is basically the question of um, infringement, which is no longer done by one big actor, but by the public, by anyone. And uh, this becomes more and more difficult to, to enforce those rights because you need to attack everyone, right? And so, I think it is actually really important in the same way as with copyright law, 
Then there are those new initiatives that emerged, such as, for instance, Creative Commons, which allow for people to build upon and to in create incremental innovation on content. Then we're actually encountering the same problem here, which is, on the one hand, citizens are not allowed to innovate and to experiment because of the patent system. On the other hand, we also need to give to those citizens a way to promote what they are building and to allow other people to, prom to, to in innovate on top of this. And so um, I think that um, at the same time there will be like a clash in the sense that uh, all these like citizen science and things like this, they, they, will, they will infringe the patents because that's the only way that people can actually experiment and innovate. And on the other hand, we, we need to actually um, conceive uh, just like a hack or like a legal hack in order to transpose the same principle of creative commons, of, um, of uh, common-based uh, innovation and experimentation. So the, the BioCommon, for instance, is an extremely interesting uh, project. And uh, the, the question then becomes, though, um, there is a difference, there is a really fundamental difference between copyright and patent law, which is that copyright is by default. As soon as someone creates content, then this content is protected by copyright. And then it is up to the creator to attach this license which will allow people to use it. In the case of patent law, by default, there is no protection. And so in order to be able to enforce the, that a discovery remain always available for others to build upon, you need to create in some way or another a property right. So you need to patent in order to then make sure that no one else can patent it. Right? Um, the alternative would be obviously to put it directly into the public domain, but then no one can patent this thing, but anyone that creates an incremental innovation will then be able to patent that incremental innovation and stop the, the innovation on that side. So I think at this point we need to really, on the, legal s on the legal level, we need to think about those two things. One is how do we allow um, citizens to innovate even when there is a patent, and the other way is how do we enable more collaboration and more uh, incremental innovation within this uh, common-based uh, ecosystem. So I think two are the major topics here. One is the responsibility and therefore the insurance mechanism of you know, allowing large research uh, efforts in order to have not only standardized da data uh, and protocols, which is something that uh, it's also a huge di discussion in the open data uh, framework, um, but also make sure that there is a sort of uh, responsibility of people that provide this data, analyze this data, and you know state that you know uh, we should do that or, or, or other stuff. At the end, most of science, uh, at least like environmental science, uh, the antibiotic uh, um, crisis, for instance, is one example. Uh, is also something that will go. Uh, and, and it's going into policy assessment, so decision making at political level. Um, so this is one of major topic, I guess, uh, which I invite you to make questions. And, um, and the second one is um, how to allow, allow this incremental innovation by protecting, uh, uh, I would say, both tangible and intangible assets around uh, what citizen science can produce. Uh, Biocommons, for instance, uh, you have, well, you have in general a progressive uh, uh, digitalization of uh, the value, the financial value. Therefore, 80% of what is worth for the market nowadays is not something that is material. It's something that is immaterial. So how this apply to, to bioscience uh, that are uh, providing us food, uh, drugs, and uh, textile, biocomposite, you know, all, everything we, we, we have as a civilization is ba basically come from this uh, giant resource, which is the planet. Uh, do we really want to put patents on it? On uh, Maybe there is an elephant in the room and we are not seeing it. Um, uh, also, I wanted to ask Primavera to very briefly introduce what, what is the blockchain for you know, the, the layman. Uh, later, she will do um, a more thoroughly explanation of it, but uh, maybe it's relevant for us. So it's actually extremely difficult to explain what is the blockchain, but um, a really simple summary is basically that it is um, a special kind of database 
And the particularity of this database it, is that it is uh, append only. So once data has been added into the blockchain, it can never be deleted or it cannot be changed from the past. And uh, the other particularity it is that um, it relies on cryptography in order to ensure that only the people that actually have the right to modify the data uh, can actually do it. Um, so there is at the moment a lot of uh, fuss around the blockchain. I think it's actually really great because it's a new technology which is still being explored and we don't really know exactly like to what extent it can be useful or not. Um, I think it has like a really important use in, uh, in the context of uh, biotech, etc., as uh, some form of registry in order to store the data. And um, the, 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 main, the main benefit that I, I could imagine is this kind of uh, putting the data on the blockchain in a way that is obviously encrypted. So it's not publicly available to everyone, but it is stored there and it is stored in a way that is completely decentralized. So there is not a single person that controls the data. It is the everyone that actually contributes to the blockchain is controlling this data. And then allowing by this concept of crypto tokens, which is you can you can devise things that and you can donate those crypto tokens to certain people, which are the people that can actually access the, the, this data, which can get decrypted. And so this basically provides um, a registry and a tracking mechanism to know which data is available and which person have accessed it and which person can actually get access to this. And uh, in the case, for instance, if there is like IP licensing and things like that, it can also be used in order to follow and follow the track of what is being done with the data. Thanks. So, Joseph, uh, want to... I see Rudiger want to ask a question. Do you think... Uh, sorry, I, for I forgot your name. Anna. Anna. Um, do you think the problem of accountability and trustworthiness could be um, encountered with democratic decision-making using the blockchain, for example? Well, uh, you touched actually the critical point that uh, I have been thinking about in the past, since I know about the existence of blockchain. And that means I see uh, two different uh, ways of, of, of approaching things. One is uh, when I was telling before uh, about, uh, I, w I will go a little bit around, but I will come to answer that, okay? Um, when I, uh, well, when I was telling before about challenges, uh, some people say, ah, any new uh, technology, methodology, or approach will need some time until people get used to that and, and start to, to adopt this kind of new approaches and so on. Uh, but the truth is, uh, when you look to that, wh why, what is this time that people need to? Actually, uh, it's the time that the system needs to accommodate these uh, new approaches, be it legally, uh, through uh, new rules and so on. So then uh, it becomes legitimate from the view of the system. Uh, that's uh, how I see uh, this in this point. But uh, in the other side, uh, when I see where citizen science and other uh, other approaches, like from, from this collaborative community, uh, many things that we have been discussing here, uh, from where it comes from, actually the foundation of it is uh, based on, on mutual trust, on reciprocity principles, on self-regulation, and so on. So I see there a very uh, critical uh, conflict between one thing and another, when, and when you ask me uh, about uh, this regulation and, and, and if this would solve, if, technol uh, if blockchain technology could solve, it could in the sense of it will accommodate, as I said, uh, through rules, uh, all these new things to come. But uh, I've heard and from you today, you said it also a trustless system, right? So you don't need to trust the person, that's why it's a trustless Yes, and I would uh, like to know more about it also, uh, like how, how should a trustless system work, especially accommodating uh, practice which are coming from this kind of communities, as I was saying before. Um, just to add on this, I think that um, the, so there is like, there's this thing of the blockchain that it is trustless in the sense that people can 
interact with each other without having to trust the other person which with whom they are interacting with, which can be useful whenever there are, in fact, conflict of interest. And so I, don't, I, I know because every all the rules have been actually encoded into the, the, the smart contracts or whatever, the, um, the governance rule of, of the blockchain, then I know that no matter what, as soon as a transaction is made, it's going to trigger a different kind of transaction, etc. So I don't need to trust that someone is going to comply on the contractual um, rules that we have come into. Um, in this sense, I think that in the case of citizen science, it's not that important because people are working together, people are collaborating, and the blockchain in this sense is more of a coordination mechanism, which is really important because at the moment, if we want to scale up, it's really difficult to scale up in a way that does not require to go into these uh, you know, pyramidical structures. Whereas here with the blockchain, we can just collaborate large scale in a way that remains completely flat and like on a peer-to-peer -peer approach. And so that's a really important thing. Another place where I think the blockchain can be really useful when it comes to governance and trust is for uh, research. Um, in the sense that uh, at the moment we have this uh, inherent problem, I think, in like most, um, most of uh, patent race, where we have different individuals, different companies, etc., which are just investing a lot of money, all investing the same kind of money just to get the result the first in order to get the patent, and then all the other investments are just wasted. Uh, by using the blockchain, it is possible that everyone is actually contributing to the same kind of research and that all the money that is being invested is actually contributing together in a collaborative way to work faster and to work better. And at the end, the blockchain can keep track of how much everyone has been contributing to the research so that once the patent or the discovery is made and the patent is obtained, then the royalties can be redistributed in a way that is encoded by the blockchain. So no one can pretend that they have been working more or less. And the redistribution can be done automatically through the blockchain platform. And so this creates, this allows for competing entities to actually collaborate on the research in order to avoid the redundancy of the patent race investments. Um, but um, you also mean like corporate research and development? Because it's, um, I think in, in that case, it's usually it's the problem is that people are actually excluding open research or open source uh, from making money. And they really have to make money because their research and development department is expensive. So they really need, in the, like it's, the, it's really dogmatic that they need, we need patents to pay off our research and development department. So I can, how to, motivate like companies to participate in open process like this is um is a problem or I, mean I, I don't i actually think it's not a problem in the sense that it's it's just a matter of investment the the patent is still going to be obtained we i mean and the, the end you can decide whether or not to patent the discovery but you can perfectly have a model in which the discovery is patented but the royalties of the patent are redistributed fairly according to how much resources you have put into it and my personal vision of this and i hope i'm right but i, I i'm not sure yeah it's really speculative is that there is a point like let's say that a corporate company will say no i'm not i don't want to enter into this i'm just going to invest my own research money in something that is like siloed but then on the other hand we have like citizen, we have an university, we have people that are actually promoting a more open approach that keeps collaborating. And there is a point in which in that pool, in that uh, research pool, there is so much more computational resources and there is so much more investment than in the one company that decided to remain by itself. And then it becomes rational even for this company to actually join the pool because they can see that they will discover it first because they have more resources now. So as there is a critical mass that uh, is joining the collaborative mining pool, not mining pool, but like research pool, then automatically it creates a gravity force. And then more and more people, instead of trying to do the research on their own, will join that. And then they will be remunerated nonetheless, but according in a way that is proportional to the actual amount of resources that has been put, as opposed to just being like some kind of race and then the first one gets everything. Um, probably let's ask the audience some questions and I as the audience now, I want to, to start with the first and probably we collect uh, three questions. 
Um, my question would be, as I see it in a project that I am currently in with people from very different approaches, there's a lot of transaction costs uh, to get people that uh, do not have same uh, same uh, working cultures uh, to work together pro productively. So uh, that, that that is a question how to do that or uh, approaches of, uh, for that would be interesting for me. Yes? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh following the last uh, topic uh, regarding the redistribution based on uh, investment of resources. Um, currently, main resources are accounted as just uh, funding, whereas uh, talking about knowledge, uh, the main resources is IDs. And um, to what extent, for instance, in the blockchain, you can uh, incorporate also this kind of resources to what extent, for instance, uh, I, I was talking about the uberization or precariousness in research. Uh, a big company can su suddenly invest a lot of money toward a big deal uh, project, whereas all the IDs have been provided by citizens and didn't put any money inside and grab all the royalties afterwards just by investing a large amount of money. Like there, there is like potentially a problem there. Yeah, I've, I've kind of. Uh, yeah, the, the paradox here is that, that between trust and uh, and distribution, uh, and yeah, I wonder that on one hand we want everybody to be technological, and on the other hand we're not not trusting our uh, neighbor uh, because we think that uh, if somebody has technology that might be uh, yeah a problem. So um, maybe I should throw in a very old-fashioned uh, concept here of um, morality, you know, that to teach people what to do. Uh, in a good way or in a bad way, and based on that, trust each other instead of uh, programming everything in, in computers. Uh, um, yeah, I, I find the discussion very focused on technology right now. Yeah. Okay, so the one side, the, the let's say morality or how to distribute, and on the other side, uh, like that it's a very technology driven approach. Is there other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, a big um, aspect of scientific research is is singing uh, in a microphone. No, is um, reputation. Uh, so uh, citation indexes and so forth is a very crude representation of one form of reputation. So rather than just financing, these technologies offer the ability to leverage or represent fairly or in different ways um, the multifarious ways in which people can collaborate and develop reputation. I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on how uh, we can improve that. Thank you. I think with these three questions you're good to go and maybe we do another round uh, afterwards. Um, okay, I will uh, address then uh, the last two questions because uh, it has more to do with my topic. Uh, especially when, when talking about morality, and you can uh, directly link with the reputation uh, question. If, uh, if you talk about uh, reputation as being oh, part of the self-regulatory way of humans uh, acting and, and collaborating and interacting with each other, uh, this can be considered a, as part of uh, these moral uh, laws. So, I think it. This is. I think it is very important to say because uh, wh when I was telling before, and this uh, thing with the technology, I think the technology has a uh, great potential to uh, expo exponate, like to scale up uh, what is uh, at first human. So, in the in a sense, uh, you first will trust somebody. And then by trusting somebody, you will make yourself vulnerable and you will be more likely uh, to be trusted by this uh, somebody who you trusted. And this uh, marks this mutual relationship of reciprocity, as actually uh, trust is uh, an old way of uh, risk management. And uh, the thing is, all these uh, reputation systems uh, in... Uh, internet uh, that we see now that are working so well and are actually driving this whole collaborative thing, uh, they are all born uh, from this uh, very human 
capability of, of reciprocity. And I think the main point is, but it doesn't, uh, it's not born on technology, it's first born on human, because before, when you get your, your profile, I don't know, in blah blah car, in couch surfing, doesn't matter where, you first don't have any, uh, uh, how to say, rates. You, you're first, like, in blank. And then somebody will have to give the first one, the first pitch on you, will, will have to trust you. They will have to always to be the first. So this is, and this first one will be taking the risk to do it. And this uh, unchains all, all the technology which the technology is going to support afterwards. So just. Um, I would like to answer this and this question. <laughs> Um, to answer your question, I think it's actually we need to really look at the different kinds of contribution that we can do. I think um, in terms of the blockchain, what it's really, really amazingly useful for is for anything that is computationally intensive. And so you really just provide computation to the blockchain and the blockchain is keeping track of how much. And th so in this case, this is like the clear cut um, obvious answer. And then we actually, we, we should not think of, uh, and this goes to your question on technology versus morality. And the, the blockchain is not the answer to everything, obviously. Uh, it's a new technology which allows to mediate uh, behavior, which can enable new behavior, new forms of collaboration, but it, it, it's not sufficient by itself, unless we are like in a really strict computationally intensive system. And so what we need to figure out is like, how can we use it and how can we build the system on top, which can be a reputation system, which can be a um, system of measuring different form of contribution, which are human contribution, which are idea, which, which can be any kind of things, and then use them in order to render the process more flat, more collaborative, and uh, more efficient. And this, this goes to the transaction cost in the sense that if we are all collaborating and we, we are all working on our own problem, but we are connected through this, uh, to, through this single platform, then I don't need to know exactly how someone else is working as long as we are all putting the information on the same blockchain or on the same database, then this, this information then can be merged and I can benefit, my research can benefit from the information provided by someone else without me having to work directly with this person. So in, it, it's kind of like, in the same way as like the internet is just providing like new ways of communicating but it doesn't completely eliminate the, the human and the social factor. It's exactly the same thing with the blockchain. We have new technology which allow to reduce highly reduced transaction cost and which enable new transaction model which are more decentralized and which allow for coordination without relying on a centralized entity. But then all the traditional issue that uh, they remain, like all the ethical issue and all the moral issue, we have to deal with them and we should not definitely not say that the technology is gonna deal with everything of this for sure. Um, yeah, I also want to say something to that, uh, the question about being technology centered or not. Um, I agree with you and um, I also think that the debate on citizen science and citizen innovation can do without focusing on technology because it's actually thanks to technology. I mean the, uh, the internet communication is making it possible like um, exchange over for internet forums and the drop in costs and computation, also the availability of uh, machines like 3D printers and other devices. Um, they are, that's not, it's not like the, the magic wand, like technology will solve the humanities and the world's problems, but it could be a key. And also as technology allows more people to participate, those more people might also uh, contribute better ideas and more diverse ideas. So I think uh, it's, it starts with technology, but then it also has to look at other, at other issues like env environmental and social issues. Should we take two more questions from the audience and then give the panel uh, a round to, to close? Two more questions if anybody wants. Yes, please. Um. I think with regarding the antibiotics crisis, uh, we don't have too much of a choice but to do something and trust each other because else we all lose. So um, we have to do something about it. Um, so I think there is just a choice of eventually losing if someone rips you off, steals your idea or something, or lo everyone loses anyway because no one is doing anything. 
So I, I think this is a good um, application case here. Um, but still the question was a bit unanswered that I asked in the first place. Um, let's say we have this phage and it has been developed by a bunch of decentralized researchers using the blockchain and everything's there. And then uh, the patient is severely ill and he wants to use it, but can he trust it? Who guarantees that these bunch of individuals that are spread all over the place have done a good job? Um, and I ask again, is the democratic decision making a way to go or do you see any other ways to go? Thank you. Is there another question? Okay, then we take this one. It's big enough. <laughs> um, please. I think you already said it's not really my or our topic, but I think it's a really, really important one. So just give wh what you think about it. Well, yeah, it's, it's really not my topic, but I mean, when it's a, if it's a collab collaboratively developed uh, cure for something, why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't the main, uh, the same uh, rules and regulations apply as to uh, conventionally uh, developed uh, cures or, or medicines. I know it would would go would have to go through a testing to prove it's it's harmless. Or I don't know. That's what I what I would think. But um, I, I agree with her. I think, for example, uh, it doesn't mean that you you, don't, you have no control at all. I mean that there must be a, a, a balance between uh, trust and and control. The, um, too much of control will also always in the end paralyze people and people will be uh, like uh, uh, doing the safe choice instead of the, the right choice. But uh, I think like for example uh, what was said uh, here before in another talk about uh, extended peer review, I think this is uh, very important from, from uh, this possible paradigm shift in science uh, when you start including other sources of knowledge and other ways of producing knowledge, uh, still you, you would have the peer-to-peer -peer review. It has just to be extended. And another point would be uh, to work with would be also uh, the notion of informed consent. That means, uh, of course, the same uh, in, in, in health, uh, the relation uh, doctor-patient. You, you have the risks, and the risks have to be communicated. The uncertainty has to be communicated. And by there, there is a shared responsibility to for the outcomes. So I think this is my... No, I will add that this is this is really not my area at all. But <laughs> I guess it's kind of like the um, it's, it's it's like the open source, right? So at the moment, the trust is done because there is a big entity that has developed reputation, and people trust that if this entity is certifying this product, then it's a good product. This can still be done, even if if it's uh, developed by citizen science, because the if it's open we can always certify, there can be like a third party that certify whether this is actually a good product or a, a, a good uh, solution. But uh, the, the, the main advantage I think is actually that it's, it everything is open source. So we can see how it has been done, we can see the result, we can see what, uh, what was the reasoning around the result. And then the eyes of millions, eventually they are probably trustworthy more so than one centralized entity that is actually driven by profit. Right. So um, in the same way as we can trust open source software be because it's just open source, then I think that citizen science results, which are actually open, can also be trusted to that extent without, without removing the possibility of anyhow applying the standard uh, mechanism anyhow. So I think, yeah, the open questions that will uh, uh, remain after this, uh, this panel, this track, is... Uh, it's basically the the trust, but applied both to the insurance, you know, so institution politics want this mechanism to be safe, especially if we are talking about biosafety, that have different degrees of uh, of uh, responsibility and uh, and uh, unpredictability. Uh, so we we actually need these to be solved as a issues, uh, not the all these issues, but at the same time allow citizens to participate. So we don't know still if it's going to be technology uh, or law mechanism or a mixture of them or uh, maybe just like uh, realizing that we are all stakeholders in this uh, huge mess we created in this planet. So probably we should really, really, really find the time to collaborate more 
to standardize protocols and uh, and way to produce and extract knowledge from data and uh, and so it's all the same rhetorics I guess for some of you that are into open science and stuff but uh, again we we still not have solved that all this stuff so um, I thank all the participants to the AM panel and all the keynote speakers uh, and all the audience to be there. And uh, see you next year, maybe, with the, we, can, we cannot say, but it's going to be a very nice track. Um, yeah, we'll leave you with that. <laughs> and thanks to, to Josef. Yeah. Thank you to the panel. Uh, if every time somebody says, you know, this is not really my topic, uh, afterwards come such insights I would be really happy. So congratulate uh, all the three of you for all the insights that you gave uh, all of us. And uh, after a 15 minutes break, we are back here with the decentralization track, which uh, will be uh, started by Primavera with the blockchain. I thought like, what is the blockchain? I had the, the question marked down and would have tracked you down to ask. Uh, I hope I will manage to answer. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you.